as you look at the structure of the psalm, you realize it's a chiastic psalm. So it has this repetition. If you remember the last time we talked about chiasm. The chiastic structure of this psalm, we will take a look at that and we'll see A, B, C, D, E, F, G, F, E, D, C, B, A, the pattern in the 22 verses of the psalm. Some people say it's an alphabetic psalm. It is a chiastic psalm. Again, in the first stanza, so to speak, David is calling on his soul to bless the Lord and also calling on the worshipers to bless the Lord because of what he says are the many benefits that God has given. Then he proceeds to list these benefits. If you take a look at verse 2, after the word benefits, you will see a colon. Let me read verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with love and kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I'd actually like to read that from the Amplified Bible because I think it does a good job of filling in some of the language distinctions here. So reading from verse 2, Bless and affectionately praise the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget any of his benefits, who forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you lavishly with loving kindness and tender mercy, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the soaring eagle. So we have these benefits being mentioned here, and you probably can think of the benefits that you have received, and why you are called to bless the Lord or praise the Lord is to get you to a good place. I want to focus on the fact that he doesn't say, I will praise the Lord, even though modern translations say, praise the Lord, O my soul. I like the King James, bless the Lord, because bless means more than praise. You can praise with your mouth. But this bless idea goes beyond the mouth. In fact, what does he say in verse 1? Bless the Lord, O my soul. He's awakening his soul, his inner being, to praise the Lord. You probably have heard the expression, fake it till you make it. You can sing a song and your heart is not in the song. He is saying he wants his whole being to be in this singing, this praise to God. So this call to worship, a personal call to worship, and also a call for the people to come to worship God reflects on what God has done, the benefits that they have received from God. In these pandemic times, it's hard to get that focus. When things are going well, you can look back and say, what the Lord has done for me, I cannot tell it all. <laughs> but in these times, you look and you see what hasn't been done, and in the moment, you can get that sense of, well, Lord, where are you? Why is this happening? Etc looking back down the road we will see the goodness of God more clearly 2020 they say or hindsight they say is 2020 vision we will be able to look back and see as the footprints in the sand poem says where he has led us and carried us when we thought we were going it alone but God is indeed carrying us and moving on to the second portion of this psalm from verse 6 through verse 18 he focuses on these attributes of God, and he focuses in a historical context. In fact, what he does is he uses the history of Israel to focus on these attributes of God. In verses 6 through 18, he focuses on the righteousness of God, the justice of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, and the compassion of God. Let's go back to the first five verses where he says it's a personal testimony of God's graciousness to David, God's mercy in his own life. And even though he talks to the people as well and calls them to worship, the pronouns that are in that first focus are me and my, when he focuses on himself, and you and your, when he focuses on the Israelites, or the people who are called to worship at that point in time. In verses 6 through 18, the focus of the pronouns is we, us, and our. Looking at that history. 
And the third portion of the psalm is a call for all in the dominion to bless the Lord. It focuses on the heavenly host, and then it comes back to say, everyone in his dominion, all he has created, all who come under his dominion, praise the Lord. The focus there is you. You all, heavenly hosts and earthly creation, called by God to be his chosen. Bless the Lord. Get your whole being in the worship. So you remember the song, put your whole self in. Or to use a more modern cliche, all in. Not just your mouth, but your whole being. It is possible to worship with your mouth, but your heart is far away from God. In fact, there are times when God says to all his people, these people worship me, with, worship me with their mouth, but their heart is far from me. The first reference I can find to that is Isaiah 29, 13, and the Lord said, because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. And they come to you as people come, and they sit before you as my people, and they hear what you say, but they will not do it. For with lustful talk in their mouths they act. Their heart is set on their gain. And then Jesus says in Matthew 15, 7 through 9, You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So the psalmist is calling on himself to awaken in his soul recognize what God has done, the benefits that God has bestowed on him, calling the people to worship, recognize the benefits that God has bestowed on them as a people, and then pour their whole selves into the worship. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all, everything in me, everything within my being, should bless his holy name. So blessing, I say, dimensionally exceeds praise. To bless the Lord is to praise him with deep affection and gratitude for who he is and what he has done and what he continues to do. This is why John Newton writes in his song Amazing Grace that this mercy, this what God does for us is truly amazing. So we have a sense of the background, the author, David, the purpose, that call to worship on a personal level, but also calling the people to worship, to search deep in their souls and bless the Lord for all of his benefits to them, using the historical context, calling on all heavenly beings and all earthly creation to bless the Lord. And what I need to do now is to add some context. So let's look back at the second portion of the psalm, which is from verses 6 through 18. David uses a historical context and he goes right back to what happened at Sinai when Moses came down from the mountain and saw that they had built a golden calf. So that takes us back to Exodus chapter 32. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Go, get down, for your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. <laughs> they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt! Exclamation mark. 
Verse 9, And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make out of you, Moses, a great nation. Verse 11, Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say, He brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply their descendants as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of I give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. Verse 14, So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. Verse 15, And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides. On the one side and on the other, they were written. Now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, It is not the noise of the shout of victory, nor the noise of the cry of defeat but the sound of singing I hear. So it was, as soon as he came near the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. So Moses' anger became hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder, and he scattered it on the water and made the children of Israel drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you, that you have brought so great a sin upon them? So Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people, that they are set on evil. For they said to me, Make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And I said to them, Whoever has any gold, let them bring it all. So they gave it to me, and I cast it in the fire. And this calf came out. There is Aaron, making up a story. Chapter 33 focuses on the command to leave Sinai. It begins, Then the Lord said to Moses, Depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your descendants I will give it. And I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you, on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. Chapter 34 Moses makes new tablets. The Lord said to Moses, Cut two tablets of stone like the first ones, and I will write on these tablets the words which were on the first tablets which you broke. So be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you, and let no man be seen throughout all the mountain, let neither flocks nor herds feet before that mountain. So he cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose in the morning and went up Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. Then he said, If now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people. 